Hey, Brett, thanks for joining us today. As we're getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, pleasure to, to meet you uh, virtually here. And um, we've had a lot of uh, interaction with your content and, and it seems to be right up the alley of, of myself and my friends and peers uh, in the industries. But um, yeah, I've been, been, uh, been selling my entire career. I've never done anything else. I guess it would be back uh, to high school before I was not on some sort of, of quota and commission. So um, interestingly enough, continue to learn more and more every day and probably uh, develop more now than I did when I was 20 years old. So um, now I'm with, uh, with ADP, Automatic Data Processing. Um, we have a, a comprehensive services division that is kind of a, a fully outsourced or an ASO model. So like maybe full service accounting or um, full service IT outsourcing, kind of like that for HR and HR technology. So that's what I do now and uh, absolutely love it. High level of, of consultation and partnership with, uh, with clients and prospects. So um, had a lot of, uh, of different roles that kind of led into to that one, but um, that's, that's where I'm at and what I do now. And is it an easy sale? Sounds easy. Well, it's, it is absolutely, um, a double sale, right? So, yeah. um, when, when we talk about what is, what is the proper, you know, solution for you? Do you even, do you even need technology? Sometimes it's a triple sale. So do you need technology? Is my company the right fit? And then is this very specific platform of support, partnership, consultation, additional resources, and additional investment, um, the proper fit for you guys versus not just what's available with, with my own company, but the entire market overall. So double sale, triple sale, um, pretty much every single time, which is enjoyable and it's totally different. So um, I don't feel like we get told no, or I don't have to get told straight no very often because it is a different model and that's very freeing because we're making recommendations that don't have an exact correlation somewhere else oftentimes, if that makes sense. And what's the hardest part of it? Good question. Uh, the hardest part of that is making sure that you're making a recommendation where it's the right fit. Yeah. So we can try to put a square peg in a round hole anywhere that we need to, but there's, and there's probably solutions like this all across the market and definitely all across the technology market. When you're selling something that is enhanced or it sounds enhanced, the ability to wordsmith that and silver tongue that to a yes isn't actually what you want to do. And we have such a tendency to, to do that and to try and make everything sound so, so gospel perfect when in reality, what we should be looking for is what are the reasons that this might not be correct? And because if we're, if we're positioning an enhanced partnership long-term, then we need to spot any red flags for why that isn't the fit, because we can only, we can only mess that up so many times before enough people tell their friends and I don't have the right market and the right brand anymore. Yeah. So instead of what is every reason that I can get somebody to say yes, it's how well can I walk them through potential pitfalls or red flags in the middle of a process and there's a balance there. There's a fine line between sounding negative, like literally sounding negative about your own solution and making sure that they're the right fit. So that's, that's the most challenging part for me is just striking that balance of who is the right fit and when to cut bait if it's not. And how long did it take you to feel like sales is the place for you? Was it a natural progression or was it... Well, that, that's a good question. I know that that early on, the assumption was whether whether it was through, you know, cliches like just charisma and, and you know, just intuitive conversation and all these yeah. things that people, you know, without that experience would say matter. And so initially, I'm like, well, this is this is great. You know, people tend to seem to want to buy from me and I tell a lot of jokes and, and OK, we'll see how it goes. I basically unlearned all of that then realized that it is almost completely irrelevant. Sure, it's there's I guess there's applications, but, you know, networking events are very, very different from consulting with an actual, you know, company and and that level of, hey, you're a good salesperson because of these things generally is completely wrong is what I've had to unlearn and relearn and our the business acumen and our understanding of the industry and our understanding for what would be an intelligent buying decision, not just with my product, but with any product in the market, 
that has nothing to do with, you know, what 15 years ago, people would say you're a good fit for that job. And they're just not correlated to me anymore. So um, I think my answer to that question is completely changed. I don't know. Does that make any sense? It, it makes a lot of sense because a lot of us get into sales or are led into sales by saying, oh, you've got the gift of gab, you're a people person, right. you know, that, that, and those skills are better to have than not have. Yeah. It doesn't uh, hurt. Right. But when you talk to great salespeople, it's like, uh, you know, there's a lot more there than somebody who's enjoyable to talk to, somebody who's really understands the problems, fit, tries to find the right match, kind of can anticipate how a deal will flow, how to keep it on track. Yeah, if you, if you asked me, you know, would you rather have an, an incredible sense of humor or be <laughs> the best the best question asker in the world 1000 percent. i want to know how to ask the best questions of each company that i can and if i never said anything remotely funny for the entire 10 meeting sales process i would so much rather be a great asker of questions and a great listener and those type of things is what i've you know learned you know over the past decade um you know from whether it's just the the assumption of of sales capability versus what the reality is to actually deliver for our clients. And where did you pick that up? Was it by observing the successful people in your company? Was it some, someone tell you, or was it, it just didn't work or didn't translate into the larger sale? Certainly a little bit of, of all of the above, right? So observing people that are, are very successful and especially even across different industries, you see these traits of their acumen of, of whether it's the industry that their client is in and all that is based on, on questioning um, the real, you know, buying concepts that they're after. So the emotions of the buyer and what's truly important to them, um, all these concepts of, I don't really want to participate in some type of RFP because I can't engage with you and understand what's really driving this. I can't help you in that scenario. So you start to see that and start to be introspective about what you're doing. And then really as you progress and as you learn and try to ask better questions and understand the buyer better, you see their feedback changing and you see how what was a recommendation based on two factors that you've uncovered turns into 10 factors that you've uncovered and it completely changes the ROI and the complexion of that deal. And so I think that just through experience, you learn how much more important it is to attach to that buyer's outcomes than, you know, be the most likable person in that room. And how did you develop this curiosity? Was it something you had through school or was it something that you just said, I got to develop this because I, without it, I don't have much of a deal? Right. I, I think that um, a couple of things. So I, I, you know, we've taken plenty of, uh, personality tests from all sorts of engagement tools and things to, you know, make you a better leader or a better employee or whatever. Um, and then there's a lot of trends around, Hey, I'm trying to connect macro trends. I'm trying to understand something from start to finish fully. That's just, that's just how I'm wired. I don't know if I'm good at it, but I know that, you know, that's how I'm wired is to figure those things out from, from point A to point B and connect yeah. them well and help other people connect them and put it into as layman's terms as I can. So that kind of kicks off the curiosity of how do I do that best for each client? Cause that's what I want to do. Um, I'm also a, a, like all of us probably just very, very competitive and to be in a process and, and have it say, this is, this is basically a parody situation. You don't look much different than another vendor from a technology sales perspective. You don't look that much different from another uh, demo that just, I can't stand it. So I want to identify early on, what are the true factors here that matter? So that if you're going to tell me, no, I'm going to beat you to it. And because I'm still competitive and that I just, I don't, and maybe it's a character flaw. Maybe I'm just a bad person, but I can't handle someone saying, I just like that one better. I can't really give you any reasons. I just liked it better. So anything I can do to avoid that answer in that situation, I want to do. And that means I need to understand the criteria and the emotions and the business outcomes as well as I possibly can. And then I do get to avoid that because we know what's most important. If you tell me that the look and feel of a technology is the most important, well, I know where we're going already. And I basically want out of the thing. 
Or if you tell me, if I can really get in enough to know that the real decision makers say price is most important, then I know where we're going. And I know what this coin flip is going to turn into. So I can avoid that awful, awful competitive nightmare that that is, I don't know what the criteria is. So I'm just going to flip a coin and pick. That's why I want to understand the deal as well as I can. Um, and it also allows us to deliver properly. We know what's important. So now I know what I need to execute on and what constitutes a successful partnership long-term. Because a lot of reps are scared of those answers, that they think that they can change the priorities or change the other person. Yeah. Instead of hitting it directly and either exploring it or letting it go. Because you're right, if it's not going to, if you're going to lose lose now, not 10 months from now. Right. So that's, um, I, w I was there. I'm, I'm sure we all were, but I was there too. And my, my assumption was I can just silver tongue my way into something that nobody else could get, right? I, I can get a deal that somebody else couldn't. And that's some kind of badge of honor. Well, you learn that that's not really a good thing because you probably missed a lot of stuff just over out relationshiping somebody else or, or just making something look a little bit better. And what you learn is that, you know, with, with most products. So from, from my experience, like consulting or technology is what I've spent my career in. Um, there are very, very bad reasons to buy something. The look and feel of a technology, I do not think is a good reason to buy something. Obviously price is a terrible way to buy something because there's so much more wrapped up in ROI than the price itself. So if you're going to buy that way, I promise you, it is much worse to find out at the end of the deal than it is to find out they're going to do that in the middle. So we want to know as soon as we can, if they're going to buy it in a way that I would say is, is wrong or less than ideal, I want to know as soon as I can. And that pain is way, way better than the pain at the end when I thought I was going to maybe get it. And it went to somebody that I know in the industry, in town, nightmare, can't handle it. So yeah, I, I agree. We, we all try to avoid that pain in the process because we want to feel positive as long as we can. But over time, it's certainly net worse. And where's this competitiveness come from? Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know. It might be hereditary. Um, you know, we all, we all grew up, we all grew up playing sports and everything, but um, you know, if we're, if we're going to do it, we might as well win. And do, do you think someone can be successful in sales without being competitive? Um, maybe they don't call it the same thing and maybe yeah. they don't yeah, they display it, it in out. the same way, but there's got to be something there. Like you, you, otherwise, what are you waking up to do? Um, why would you care? Why would you do the, or if, if, yeah, if you're in a job and you're making money without being competitive, let me know. Cause that sounds great. <laughs> if you can <laughs> just, uh, good, <laughs> if you can just phone it, if you can just phone it in and still make money, then, you know, I'm in, let's do it. And is it the desire to win or the hatred of losing? Oh, uh, it's the hatred of losing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, and, and when you feel like you're compared to something else or even compared to another person, um, that, that introspection, while it's incredibly beneficial and you learn so much, um, you know, that's, that's awful. You expect to win, which is why losing is worse. And, is it the competition against other companies? Is it the competition against your peers? Is it the competition against yourself and how you did last year? Well, what's the what's the premier thing that yeah, like, gets you up and gets you focused and fired it's up? Great question. It's um, for me, and and a lot of times I I think we got to slow down to answer that question. But but it's versus it's versus yourself, right? So. And, and I think a lot of that is the difference between, you know, confidence and arrogance, maybe. So, so I think that I can get, I can get into an arrogant place if I'm only comparing myself to, to other people or other options or competitors or things like that. Um, you know, I think that that's coming from a place of arrogance. The place of confidence is comparing to myself, which is how am I developing and how fast and how much better can I get? And, and as you know, within a selling profession, there is no, there is no ceiling because the market is changing beneath us all the time. The second that you've mastered the market today, it's moved. It moves literally constantly. So, 
so it's, it's competitive versus yourself with, with where you're able to go and what you're capable of and, and whether you're, you're stopping for some reason or you've, you've missed the mark on something. Yeah, you're, you're competing versus yourself and your own, your own brain, your own tendencies, both positive and negative. So, yeah. And how do you grade that? How do you evaluate that? You know, you this year versus you last year? Is it the income? Is it win rate? Is it deal size? Is it ranking? Yes. So that <laughs> I'll let you know when I find out because that is a that's a head trip because there's so many criteria that are in front of you all the time. Obviously, um, if you're working for you know another corporation, so if you're B two B, right? They're going to stack rank you, and they stack rank you because it freaking works, right? It drives you insane, <laughs> and they're not going to stop doing it. It's supposed to drive you insane. That's why they show you. So that stack rank is awful. I don't look. I never look. I can't look. I'll look at the end of the year. Don't tell anybody I said so, but I, I despise looking. But that means that it already works and I'm already probably semi-aware. So I don't need to look at the chart to have a rough idea. Um, and that's an, that's an awful process. So, so you're obviously stack ranking versus your peers. Um, financially, that's the end metric because you know we're, we're, we're doing it for our family and then we're doing it you know, to win and for ourselves. So if, if the effort doesn't equate financially, then either you really need to develop or you're not in the right scenario, whether it's the right job, the right company, whatever. So the financial metric is very important. Um, but if you can get a little bit more philosophical, you're able to see where am I developing and you're able to make those, those goals around development where I want to get better. And you should be able to feel those in the opportunities that you're working. If I said I want to improve questioning. I want to improve my understanding of the market overall so that I can speak towards the market and not just my solution. You're going to know if you're getting better and if you're doing it. And so for me, I've written a lot of those down at the beginning of the year said, yes, I want to make money. Yes, I want to beat everybody else at everything. But here's the five areas I really want to develop, actual development. And you can see if you're progressing along those and then having peers that know about that and can check you on it and tell you if it's working is also very beneficial for me. And what do you see as your strongest characteristic as a salesperson? Um, boy, I don't know. I try to, I, I try to avoid going there in my mind as, as much as I can. I know what I'm working on the most. So the, the thing that I'm working on and I want to be the best at is, is providing, providing simplicity of these very complex decisions, which again, necessitates an understanding of the entire market. So if I only explain to you my option, I'm not really helping you. I need to be able to understand every option so that I can compare and contrast properly. So if there's 10 top options, if there's 10 common options, I need to know all 10 of them as well as I possibly can so that I'm able to compare and contrast. And that simplicity for the buyer is so important. And that's, that's where I'm trying to be valuable. And that way, if I don't get the deal, I've been so valuable in helping them that they can go tell everybody else that it was valuable. And there's so much transparency. There's such a lack of, of salesmanship, quote unquote, there. I'm just trying to be as valuable as I can. So I want to be the best at understanding the market overall and then applying that to their business. So I can say, I actually know how to buy this better than you and hopefully as well as anybody else. And that's the real, the driver is I'm going to help you buy this and I'm going to tell you where I think that way of thinking is incorrect based on everything that I've learned. That's what I want to be best at, I guess, is how I'd answer. And what do you feel is your weakest skill or characteristic? Um, I, I still have the tendency to, um, I still have the tendency to want to make everything sound pretty positive. Um, I, I still can put a spin on something that sounds fine. And I'm learning every single day to make sure I'm thinking through whether that's going to come back later. Like, is this going to come back in four months? And if it does, I need to shut up. Do I know how to answer that now and, and head off into a great weekend? Yes, I do. I know what I could say to mitigate that scenario or mitigate that question for now. But is it going to come back in 90 days? And that's what I'm, I'm weakest at because I'm just, I just naturally want to have a positive and fun and enjoyable conversation and day. 
And so that's what I'm learning all the time is to, to find the pain now so you don't find it later. And when you're sitting through a QBR and you hear other reps talk about deals, do you see yourself being able to tell which deals will close and which won't? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's just a ton of experience, but um, yeah, you can, you can see that pretty quick. It's even better if you get a recording of a call and you can listen to the buyer really objectively and say, there's no chance. <laughs> like you got to hear how they're answering that question. Like, no way. What are you doing? Um, and, but conversely, you could have, you could have the, the rep on the other side, just overjoyed at the process. And sometimes it'll hit you and be like, no way. Well, well, that's it, because the client doesn't like delivering bad news. So they're not going right. to overtly say, we're not going with you. Gonna, they'll give you the, so, what we need to think about it, we, the delays, the obfuscations. The... What's interesting, is, and probably in every scenario, every industry, everything you're selling, um, I'm trying to develop a list of questions that will better identify that buyer's mindset. So with, with what I do, that's, that's heavy consultation and, and a heavy level of strategic partnership around their business, there are questions that I can ask that will reveal you're not in that place and you're, never, you're not going to be in that place. So I either need to talk to somebody else or we're probably not a good fit. And so obviously I'm in the, the HR environment. If, if I ask someone, hey, you're about to acquire 10 locations in 10 different states, what are your concerns? Well, I don't have any. <laughs> well, you really should. Yeah. So that would let us know, like, you're probably going to get to the end of this. And the ROI that you see is going to be different than the ROI that they see. And you should have known that from the first call. So I'm trying to develop that list of questions and then share that with, you know, my other peers and reps is to say, you should have an indication as to how they're going to see this entire process. And here's some questions that can help us do that. And I wish I would have known that 10 years ago, but um, that's been very interesting, just identifying the temperature of a deal as soon as possible based on the mindset of, of that buyer. Now, you've talked a lot about questions. Do you spend a lot of time designing them before a call? Yes. Um, yeah. So a, a standard template of, of questions um, that go from as, as strategic as possible, as macro as possible about that business all the way down to what they want to talk about, which is a list of requirements or a technology itself. Um, and, and through that, the idea is obviously for, for us to talk as little as possible and understand what they might not have even considered, right? So if they want to go straight to a criteria, either it's because they don't trust us and they shouldn't at that point, but they don't trust us and they want to do some type of soft RFP, here's what I need, but there could be factors in that business they don't understand what we provide yet. So how could they ask the right questions? Right. We need them to talk, right? I need to understand the macro scenario and the goals that they have. So we want to go as, as wide as we can and generate as much free-flowing conversation, open-ended questions, et cetera, and then narrow it all the way down to some more specifics and eventually next steps. Because I got to believe they'd want to commoditize you. Have you looked the same as four or five other players? Yeah, and they already have. Yeah, they, they, don't, they already have before you walk in the door. How do you get them to understand the distinctions? Beat them to it. Beat them to it and say, hey, this thing right here, it's commoditized. Let's put it over there for now. We'll come back. That's going to look and feel the same. I'll tell you off the bat, it pretty much is. Here's yeah. what I want to understand because this is how we've been able to help. So if, if they see it as a commodity, and it is a commodity, then our level of self-awareness around that, it automatically, um, it just rapidly increases trust, right? So, so anytime you, it's, it's saying something that you're not supposed to say, quote unquote. If, if they don't think that you should be in that frame of mind with them, the fact that we are rapidly increases trust and allows us to have a conversation that's actually beneficial on all sides. So yeah, if, if they're putting it in a commodity box, let's just beat them to it immediately. And what do you wish you learned the first year in sales that you know today? Oh, I wish I would have learned that, that the acumen of how you should buy something for whatever that product is that, that you have is just so much more important than, than how you position what you do. 
Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, I, I do have uh, one of my first sales managers used to hold her breath if I monologued and say that I was killing her because I wouldn't shut up. That was interesting. Um, but I, yeah. How did you take that? I, I, um, well, it worked and my <laughs> wife started doing it. So I'd just be sitting at the dinner table and she'd act like she's going to keel over and fall out of the chair because my monologue was, was too long. I just felt like I had so many things to say when I was 20 years old. I just wanted to make sure that they understood. Um, but yeah, learning that that's not the best way to go about it would have been great. But when we're first in sales, we think we're obligated to talk, that if we're not talking, we're not selling. And then we quickly right. find and out I, the questions are much more powerful than statements. And, and I mean, even the, the simple concept of, of what makes someone actually like you, it's, it's being able to talk about themselves, right? I, I would have loved to know that. Um, you know what? I just really like that Brian guy. Well, it's because he let me talk for 30 minutes. You're subconsciously going to like anybody that lets you talk about yourself. Right. You're looking at somebody else that. talking about yourself. Right. Yeah, it would have made me shut up a lot faster, a lot sooner. But how do you get the HR people and the finance people who are not the social butterflies of the world, right? They're the kind of brass tacks, you know, rows and columns type people. How do you get them to open up? Ah, that's, a, that's a great question. And they're all so different, right? And, and they're all so different, but they still have hobbies. Um, I think that at this point, our personality mirroring is probably very, very subconscious. But if someone was new to those industries, I would want to go through that front and center. Um, you know, I, I think that people that have been doing it for a long time are very, but the, the personality mirroring is so strong with those folks. And that opens them up. So immediately into their, their speaking cadence, their posture, if they want to be rough around the edges, so are we. If they want to be overly transparent, if they want to just be insulting towards the industry and the process itself, let's do that. I'm game. Fine. Um, if you want to be cranky, let's be cranky. Um, if you want to be awkward, let's do it. So that, that really helps open those folks up. Obviously, if you try and oil and water that with a, a very, very cut and dried CFO is not going to work. So you start with, with heavy, heavy personality mirroring. And then um, just through, through profiling and questions. And, and a lot of that is just our own personal, personal character, or at least sales character, where we're, we're so transparent and, and we're actually doing what we say we're going to do. We're really being trustworthy um, and open about how we want to help in the process. They open up quickly after that. Um, I think they've learned to be guarded from a lot of sales processes, especially in HR and finance, but also the organization itself. They've got to deal with everybody and they've got to deal with highly empathetic situations. So they're just naturally guarded from fluff. Um, so yeah. cutting through that is, is probably pretty important. Cool. Hey, Brett, I really appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Yeah, so uh, I'm on LinkedIn. So it's... Uh, Brett Wampler uh, on LinkedIn and, um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, some opportunities or certainly some speaking opportunities and videos out there within the industry. Um, those are probably on my LinkedIn page. But uh, other than that, um, I'm fairly off the grid on an island in Florida and try to keep it that way. <laughs>